Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is truth. Thank you for revelation you're bringing forth this night. We thank you for all that you accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you many messages regarding the subject of end time events. And we're going to talk to you tonight about another important aspect, which you must understand, especially when we get to teaching on the rapture, because you must understand about the revelation of the seventh month. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We begin in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The seventh month is significant because it is the time of the fulfillment of the final three feasts of the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 23, it talks about the seven feasts of the Lord. They're not meetings for food or, or whatever. They were holy convocations of meetings with God for the purpose of pointing out by the types what Jesus Christ would accomplish. And Jesus fulfilled the first four in his first coming. He was the Passover lamb on the very day of Passover being made sin. He fulfilled unleavened bread by bearing away the sin, by going down into hell for three days and three nights, paying the price for sin. He was the first born from the dead, getting a brand new spirit and being that first fruit. He went up to heaven and presented himself before the Father, having accomplished the redemption for us. And then 50 days later was the day of Pentecost, when after he had gone back to heaven after revealing himself and sharing things with the, those for 40 days, he went back to heaven, was seated at the right hand of the Father, and was the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then he, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, sent him in on the very day of Pentecost, which caused the beginning of the church to, on earth to be born again, people to be born from above as they re were receiving Jesus. Those four feasts have been fulfilled on the exact day by Jesus. There are three other feasts, and they are in the seventh Hebrew month, which is Tishri. The seventh Hebrew month, there are three feasts. The first one is the Feast of Trumpets on the first day, and that is pointing towards the rapture, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. The second one is on the tenth day, and that is the Day of Atonement, which is the day of judgment. That is the day when there will be the final judgment on the nations at the Battle of Armageddon. And then the next final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles that begins on the 15th day and ends on the 21st day. So here in the seventh month, the ark resting on the seventh month, this is after the judgment had come. The 17th day of the month, that would be in the middle of that seventh month, and that's in the middle of the time of tabernacles, that is. Notice that it's on the mountains of Ararat. This is where the ark rested after the flood was over. Ararat, if you notice below, means the curse reversed, meaning it was now a declaration, a prophecy, that the seventh month fulfillment, the prophetic fulfillment, of what God's purposes was for all of mankind on the earth was going to be fulfilled and the curse was going to be reversed and it was going to be accomplished by Jesus Christ who is going to accomplish this at the time of tabernacles which is what this speaks of when he begins the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now prior to that in Genesis chapter 7 was in verse 11. <clears throat> in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where the, all the fountains of the deep broken up, the windows of heaven were open. This is when the judgment began to come. And the time in Genesis 8, 4 was after the flood was over, the judgment was over. And we saw, the, it said it was on the 17th day of the month. The 17th day of the month here is also when it started. 
because 17 is the number in Scripture, which we've taught you in the past, of the ending of evil, the stopping of evil, the turning around of evil. And we've gone through this in the past, but we will point out one of the Scriptures that we gave, which is in Jeremiah chapter 32. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 9, when Jeremiah purchased the field, and this was a type of purchasing the earth back from Satan who got it from the fall of man in the form of a lease that man had for 6,000 years. It was given into the hands of Satan at the fall of man. And so here's where he's purchasing back the, er, the earth, this title deed. And he bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, in Anathoth, the place of where his affliction weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. 17, again, is a number in Scripture which refers to the ending of evil. It's going to be overcoming in the ending of evil, which is what Jesus Christ came to accomplish. And, of course, why did, was there a need for the repurchase of the earth? Because it was in the hands of Satan. And in fact, we see that he had the right of redemption. He also had the right of inheritance is prophesied. Jesus is the one who came as the Redeemer, as the kinsman Redeemer, to accomplish redemption. Because there was a right of redemption that was available for man, and only God could do it through Jesus Christ. There was also a right of inheritance that was also available, but that's why Jesus had to die and be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, being born from above to get a new spirit for mankind. And once he was born from above, he became the heir as he brought the new covenant into being. And so as the heir, he now, having the right of redemption, accomplished that. And as the heir, he would have the right to bring forth this opening of the title deed of the earth because he had conquered the enemy and now he was the heir of all things. And in fact, we even see in Revelation, talking about this just for a minute, in chapter 5, verse 1, this is the scene in Revelation before the judgments are opened up by Jesus Christ, which is what happens in the tribulation. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. A book that's within, written on the inside and on the back side, is a deed of purchase. And this deed of purchase was opened up by Jesus. He's the only one who could do it. The reason is because of the fact that he is the one who had redeemed us unto God, accomplished this. He's also the one, as it says, that he had prevailed or conquered to be able to open the book and then to start bringing forth what was written on the inside, which is what is necessary to take back the earth, which was the judgments that were going to be released. This is also revealed over in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Here is when Ezekiel, it's parallel to Revelation, he said a roll of a book was there given unto him. He spread it before me. It was written within and without. That is a deed of purchase. And there was written within lamentations and mourning and woe. That is the effects of the judgments that are going to be poured out. We must understand that, as we have pointed out in the past, from the beginning of creation, it was 4,000 years until Christ came on the scene. He accomplished the redemption and brought forth the reconciliation through spiritual birth to mankind, and it began the church age. The church age is the next 2,000 years. There were four days and two days, that's six days, the six days that are uh, parallel to the 6,000 years of man from the very beginning of creation. And so then the seventh thousand year period is the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We must understand the time that we're in presently. 
And as we were talking about these things, the revelation of the seventh month is very important to understand what is happening or what is going to happen during this time. Because the time here of the church age is about up. It began in 30 AD when Jesus was born from above, accomplished the redemption, brought forth the church age by pouring out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So that's 30 AD. 30 AD plus two days of 2,000 years is 2030. 2030 is less than eight years away. That is the end of the church age. This is why you're seeing all this activity going on in the world and why you understand and you see that the nations are coming together to form a one world order which is contrary to what God wants and they're at work to accomplish this. We will see that this is going to get done before that and then there'll be the time when Jesus at the end of the 6,000 year period which is the end of the 2,000 years of the church age that then Jesus then, who's the one who conquered, will be able to open up this title deed and begin to pour out the judgments on the earth. Now this is parallel to things that are happening in the seventh month because remember the seventh month is the final three fulfillments of the work of God in for, for accomplishing what God purposes. The trumpets catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture, the judgment upon the nations, and then the millennial reign, which is the tabernacle's fulfillment. Now, as far as this, these feasts of the Lord, one thing you must understand, and you'll hear this later, but it's when we get to the talking about the rapture. All the feasts of the Lord have been fulfilled in order. Passover was first, unleavened bread second, first fruits third, and then Pentecost fourth. That was the order. They're going to be the same way in the last three. They will not be out of order. It will be exactly as the order is. There will be trumpets fulfilled first, then the judgment will come, and then tabernacles will come, and we will see this. Now, the first fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles is the birth of Jesus. Jesus was not born on December 25th. It's not true. He was born at the time of tabernacles in the fall while they were they're all there for the time of tabernacles. That's why all the people were there and there was no room in the inn because they were all there. And Jesus came forth and was born at the time of tabernacles. The seventh month, not only prophetic of the initial fulfillment of what Jesus did, coming on the scene, being born, but also it's the time when it began his ministry as well. We see in Leviticus chapter 25, Leviticus chapter 25, we pick up over here in verse 9. Thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. Whenever you see the seventh month, it has something prophetic for the end times. What's the tenth day in the seventh month? That's the day of the judgment that's going to come. But also, this is also the time of the Jubilee. The Jubilee means liberty. It refers to the liberty that he's bringing forth to mankind. As the judgment comes on the nations, he will bring total liberty to all. And in order to show him this forth, that's when he began his ministry at this time on the seventh day, the tenth month, the tenth day of the seventh month. In the Day of Atonement, you'll make a trumpet sound through all your land. And what was this about? You'll hallow the 50th year, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. It'll be a jubilee unto you. You should return every man unto his possession. You should return every man unto his family. Here a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap, but you groweth of self, nor gather the grapes of it, of thy vine undressed. It talks about it's a jubilee. It should be holy unto you. You'll eat the increase thereof of the field. And in the year of this jubilee, you'll turn every man to his possession. It was total liberty and freedom. This was prophesied of what Jesus would do back in Isaiah chapter 61. And speaking of what ministry he would bring forth, 
in Isaiah chapter 61, we see in verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening a prison to them that are bound, to bring liberty and freedom. And he says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What's the acceptable year of the Lord? That is the year of Jubilee, bringing forth the freedom and liberty to mankind. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He began to preach the gospel, cast out the demons, heal the sick, see the people be set free from the bondages of the enemy. Now it goes on and says the day of vengeance of our God. That is also a fulfillment, but not in the first coming of Jesus. This is a end time fulfillment when there'll be the judgment that will come on the nations at that time. We know this because this is quoted by Jesus in Luke chapter 4. When he was there at Nazareth, he'd already begun his ministry. In verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. He didn't continue and say the day of a vengeance of our God, because that wasn't what he did in his first coming. That's what he will do in his second coming. Why? He is going to take vengeance and bring judgment on the nations that have rejected God's ways and rejected Jesus Christ's sacrifice, which was necessary to bring man back into relationship with the Father. So he's preached this and he's declaring this mighty work. And when he came, it's interesting, in Mark chapter 1, in verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled. What time? Notice this is the word which means a fixed and definite time. There was a fixed, definite time for this to come into manifestation. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, change your mind, and believe the gospel. Repent means to change the mind. They were to change their mind and believe the gospel. This is the beginning of the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, the time when he would begin his ministry. And he brought forth the gospel of the kingdom and began to preach that forth. Now, as he began to preach this forth, we see what he did. He cast out the demons, healed the sick, brought forth continual revelation of the, of the ways of the New Testament. He taught New Testament truth. He was pointing towards coming to the, going to the cross he, right before he went to the cross, he made the new covenant with the Father, and which, of course, couldn't come into manifestation until after he had been raised from the dead and become an heir. Jesus, having made this, he then, of course, accomplished the redemption by going to the cross and paying the price, and, and uh, having accomplished redemption, also made the way of reconciliation by getting a brand new spirit. Now, having done all that, he went back to heaven, of course, and ruling and reigning uh, in the New Testament as the King of kings and Lord of lords, but not on earth. Why? Because the, get the lease that Adam had for 6,000 years was still in the hands of Satan, who was given over to him, and until that is up, he could not come back and take control of the earth. And he will do that as we approach that time, which is coming up in about a little, little less than eight years. We come to John chapter 7, in verse 2, it says, Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. This again is whenever you see anything referring to these feasts, it has some revelation that's important for us to understand about end time things. Verse 3, His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that the disciples may also may see the works that thou doest. For there's no man that doeth anything in secret, he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. This is what they wanted him to do. But that's not what Jesus, Jesus is doing in the end, as you will see. He's not going to come forth openly in these last days to bring forth some great 
earth-shaking revival as some people have thought. It is error, as you will see. Verse 6, Jesus said to them, My time, talking about going up to this feast, the fixed, definite time is not yet come. Well, that's because it wasn't the time at the end yet, of course, and this is going to be long after this, after Jesus has gone back to heaven and the church age was over before his time would come. But he says, your time is always ready, which means to go into the fulfillment of what Tabernacles is about, which is seeing the completed work of God in the church to bring the church to perfection, to be a holy, glorious, end-time church. And we have shared that. And we'll talk about it again tonight. We come to verse 8. He said, Go ye up into this feast. I go not yet up into this feast, for again, for my time is not yet fully come. Now, when we go into verse 10, it says, When his brethren were gone up, which is all pointing towards the church going up to fulfill the prophetic fulfillment of what Tabernacles is about, which is the completion of the end time work in the end time church to be the glorious church. Then went he also up into the feast, not openly, as it were in secret, meaning that he's also going up into this feast at, at referring to the end time. Notice, his brethren were trying to get him to go openly. Is he going openly? No. Is he going to be manifest clearly and plainly in this end time? No. But as it were in secret, hidden or concealed, he is not coming in some end time open revival in these last seven and a half years up to this time, the end of the church age. Instead, he's coming to every Christian as if in secret, every church, to see whether they're going to walk in the ways of the Word of God or not, whether they're going to follow him or not. We come now to verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, and we talk about the midst, this means in the middle or midway. Jesus went up into the temple and was teaching, as it says literally. Now that tells us something, because tabernacles is pointing towards the final end time work being accomplished in the church. And Jesus going up into the temple, who is the temple today? The church. We are the temple of God. And what is he doing when he comes up into the temple in the end time church? Not openly, but as it went secret. And what is he wanting to bring to this end time church? It says he was teaching. This is a verb that's in the imperfect tense, which means literally was teaching continually. And that's what he is coming to bring in the end time church today. Why do we need continuous teaching? Because of all the false doctrine that has come into the body of Christ. There are so many things that are false almost on every single subject that are taught, unfortunately. And that is not what God wants. He, does, he wants the church to come in line and be in one accord in line with the truth. So this means Jesus is going to manifest himself in the end time church, bringing forth the teaching, and this teaching is going to be the true teaching. It's not going to be something that he decided to teach. It's going to be the teaching that comes from the Father, the real truth. Look what he says in verse 16. My doctrine, it's not mine. He's not speaking what he thinks, but his that sent me. That means he's speaking the true doctrine, which is going to be in line with the Word of God, and it's from the Father the one who sent him, because the Father wants everyone to get the true doctrine of the Lord and get it established in their life. We see an important statement made here by Jesus for who's going to get this, understand this doctrine and get revelation of it. He says, if any man wills, this is the main verb in this clause, and it is a present tense verb meaning ongoingly wills, but it's not automatic that it's going to happen in people's lives because it's what's called a subjunctive mood. We explain these things if you're here for the first time. 
The present tense, whenever you see that, it means ongoing action. When you see the subjunctive mood in the Greek, that means a conditional statement, not a statement of fact, but a conditional statement where conditions have to be met. So it's saying if any man may be continually willing, if he meets the conditions, it means he's got to set his will. To what? To be doing his will. The reason we say do, because will is not a helper verb for do. Do is an infinitive in the Greek. The King James does not translate this correctly. Young's literal does. If any man, anyone may will, may be willing to be doing his will. That is important. May be willing to do his will. He shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That means who's going to get revelation of the true doctrine? Only those who have set their will to do the word. Meaning, can you just be a hearer only? No. Can you just be a spectator hearing it and then thinking about it? No. You've got to be in a position where you're hearing it and you're going to be a doer of it, to put it in operation. As you're a doer of it, you will get revelation of the truth. We know that this is so because it was even previously said in John 3.21, He that doeth truth, not one who just hears it, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light. You're going to get revelation. We know the same thing over in John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews that believe on him, If you continue in my word, that's a conditional statement, then are you my disciples indeed. Who's one who's continuing the word? One who's doing the word. What's a disciple? A disciplined one who is doing the word consistently. What happens then? And you shall know the truth. Meaning you don't know the truth just because you heard the word. You know the truth because you're continuing the word and become a disciplined one doing it. And then the truth shall make you free. So it's important that you and I are willing to be doing continually the word in order to get the revelation of the true doctrine of Christ. That means we just can't be spectators. We can't just be hearers only. That's not going to get it done. We need to be ready to do the word. Then, verse 18, he says something. He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory. Meaning anybody who's supposedly ministering for the Lord he can't be speaking of himself. He shouldn't be talking about himself. He should only be bringing forth the word. He that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteous in him. How would we be seeking his glory? By obeying what he wants us to do, which is to preach the word. So we're not going to be speaking of ourselves, otherwise we're seeking our own glory. People that talk about themselves, that's all out of pride. No, we're going to seek his glory by bringing forth the word and that's the same one is true, and no unrighteousness is in him, as it points out. So Jesus is coming to the church, to the church, before he comes for the church, and he's coming to the church to teach the church the truth, which is the doctrine that's coming from the Father, and those ones who are willing continually to be doing it and put it in operation in their life as their lifestyle and become disciplined ones, they're the ones that are going to know of the doctrine. They're going to get the revelation. They're the ones that are also going to come to the place of being free, being delivered and set free. So this is important to understand what's happening in these days. The church must be taught. The false doctrine must be eliminated. We've talked about the false doctrine, the false prophets, the false teachers, and these kind of things. They all have to be exposed because that is also the mark of the last days with all the deception that is coming forth. Also, people need to come in line in, with the word across the board in all areas. One of the things that we see in the body of Christ that has deceived many today is they have not been tithers. They have heard the teaching that we don't need to tithe in the New Testament. It is a lie. First of all, we come back here to 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 6. 
Concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they brought in the tithe of the oxen, sheep, tithe of the holy things, and consecrated unto the Lord their God, and laid them up by heaps. Well, this was what they were doing in the Old Testament era. He goes on, and he says, And in the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps, and finished them in the seventh month. Why is that important? Why would, you, why would that be even important to even say it? Because what it's pointing to, the time period, from God's standpoint. The third month is Siwan, which is when Pentecost occurred, which is what? The beginning of the church age. So this is speaking from the beginning of the church age. Those ones began to bring, lay the foundation of the heaps from the tithes and bringing them in during the church age. And when was this finished? in the seventh month, which is the end of the church age, when the fulfillment of all the three feasts are completed. So this four months speaks of the time of the church age. Even Jesus, he said, there's four months yet to the harvest. The four months is the church age he was speaking of. And then the harvest comes forth at the end. So this speaks of the fact that they were bringing forth the tithes, and when they saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and the people of Israel. And they were doing the right thing by bringing this. And this is all what they were doing during the church age, and it needs to continue. Those people have taught that, well, I thought it ended with the law, the Old Testament. It's not true. It began with Abel, who brought of the firstlings of the flocks, which was the tithe. It continued with Abraham, who brought his tithes to Melchizedek. It continued with Jacob, who paid tithes to God as well. And then, of course, continued through the Old Testament era. And is it still continuing in the New Testament? Yes, it is. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. Here, men that die receive tithes would be a person who is receiving them. There, he receiveth them of whom is witness that he liveth. Who is the only one that's witness that he liveth? It's speaking of Jesus, who is the one who was raised from the dead. Where is there? Where he's at? Which is in heaven. Meaning that in the New Testament era, when tithes and offerings are brought unto the Lord, they are not only received by men here for the purpose of the ministry, carry out the ministry, but also it's received there by Jesus in heaven simultaneously who then is going to present it before the Father and worship because it's worship and then he opens the windows of heaven and pours out his blessings upon us. We find that this is certainly shows that people are obedient to God and those who have rejected this are have turned away from the truth. God is the same. He doesn't change. He hadn't changed anything, it's still the ties are for today. Another thing that we see regarding the seventh month is in Ezra chapter 3. When the seventh month was come, prophetic of this end time, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. The body of Christ, even though it is splintered and all over the place, there is a remnant, there is a few, there is an end time group who are going to come to the place as one man. And they are going to come to the place of walking in the ways of the Lord and come to perfection. We come down to verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer the burnt offerings unto the Lord, and the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. This means, again, prophetically, here they were offering their burnt offerings. Well, we, we are to offer our spiritual offerings unto the Lord and minister unto Him. And as they did that, we come to verse 8. In the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Jetiel, and Joshua, Joshua the, the son of Zozadek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and Levites, all they that were of the son, come out of the captivity from under Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward. What did they do? They set forward the work of the house of the Lord. That means the work of the Lord is going to be done in the end time church. And what was there? Their work was in building the house of the Lord, the physical house. 
Well, what is it for the end time church? Building the spiritual house of the Lord, which is to be built in us. We know that this is a process that's at work through hearing and doing the word. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, You as living, lively, means living stones. What's that speaking of? The spiritual house of God. Because Jesus is the cornerstone of the spiritual house of God. When you and I get born again, we become as living stones in this spiritual house of God. Our build up, not as though it's already occurred, it is an ongoing process because it is a passive, or excuse me, it's a present tense, meaning our continually being built up is the way you would translate that in the Greek, especially with a passive voice, meaning someone else is doing that. The passive voice means the subject, which is us, are being acted upon by somebody else, and who's doing that? God. We, as the living stones, are being built up continuously a spiritual house, and that is what is to happen. Well, that's what they were doing. You see, we see the types from the, what they did in the Old Testament is pointing to the spiritual realities that get done in the end time church in the seventh month time. We come to verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set their priests in their apparel, that's their clothing, with trumpets. The foundation of the Lord is laid how? By hearing and doing the word. Remember the ones who were hearing and doing the word continuously? They built their house on a rock and the foundation got laid. But the other ones built it on sand and the foundation wasn't laid and there was a great fall. Those who are hearing and doing the word that's how you build the foundation in your own life, the spiritual temple of the Lord. And furthermore, as this is laid, the priests were set in their apparel. That's their clothing. What are we to be doing? Clothing ourselves with all the things that God has for us. We put on the whole armor of God. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put on the new man. We put off the old man. We put on all these things, which is God's clothes, the garments of God. And that's, of course, what we need. We need the spiritual clothing on, not only to be, have power resident in us, but also to see the work of God be accomplished. So we bring forth fruit, we walk in His ways, we bring forth the fruits of righteousness, we walk in obedience to Him, and we don't let ourselves, of course, walk according to any of the evil ways of the world. Verse 11, they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord for His good, for His mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the, Lord, of the house of the Lord was laid. That is what needs to happen. If we're not consistent hearers and doers of the word, we'll never see the foundation laid. We may have heard a lot, but that doesn't do anything. Remember, the guys who were hearers but not doers were having continual fall. They have continual problems. They were not seeing victory. But the guys who had their, laid their foundation on the rock, then storms that came against them could not even shake them because they were established in the word of God. The true foundation was laid. Now, as this work is going forth, you must understand the devil is not going to stand by, and certainly you've seen that in your life. He tries to hinder and disrupt this building, this work being done in you. We see in Ezra 4.1, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard the children of captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, and that's what we're doing. We're building our spiritual temple unto the Lord. They came and they, they said, let us build with you. We seek your God. They were trying to come and join together with them to do what? To hinder it. No way were they going to let this happen, they said. They said, you, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves will build unto the Lord God of Israel. They were going to build it themselves, but the enemy, unfortunately, was successful against them. What did he do? The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. We cannot let the enemy come and trouble us in the building. How would he do that? To get us not hearing and doing the word. Get us off track. Get us to walk in the ways of sin. Get us to walk in the way of the flesh. Get us to walk in the ways of the world. Do anything. Draw back from doing the word of God. Well, they were successful 
And the result was the wor work, the, the, they ceased, the, then ceased the work of the house of God at Jerusalem. It got stopped all the days of Cyrus until Darius came on the scene. Well, because they weren't in tune, they weren't in line with the word. Well, in order to get them back on track, Agehi, the prophet, and Zechariah, son of Odo, Ido, they prophesied in the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them, they began to speak to them to get them to build. And you have to understand, what did the prophets do in the Old Testament? They spoke the word of the Lord to them and exhorted them on what they were supposed to do. So they were speaking to them to get busy, and they began to build the house of God. That means what caused them to get on track again, hearing the word. If you're not hearing the word, will you be doing it? No. Will you be building the house of God in your life? No. You'll be walking in the flesh. You'll be maybe following the ways of the world or doing something else instead of doing the things that God wants. Well, they began to build to see this building be accomplished. We come over to Nehemiah chapter 7, and it's interesting here, in verse 73 at the very end of this chapter, the priests, the Levites, porters, singers, some of the people, Nethathans, all Israel, dwelt in their cities, and when the seventh month came, that's prophetic of this end time in the end time church, the children of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man, because what's going to happen? The people that are going to be seeking after God and wanting to see Him accomplish this great work, they're going to be gathering them themselves together as one man to do what? They came before the water gate, and Ezra brought the book of the law of Moses out. They're going to hear the word of God. Verse 2, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. It's emphasizing that this is what's happening in the end time church in order to teach it the truth and bring the true doctrine of the Lord. And these guys just weren't wanting to hear a scripture or two and then go their way and do whatever they wanted. Look what it says in verse 3. He read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. The morning was at dawn, and the midday would be noon. Well, that's six hours. These guys were hearing the word continually, six hours. Before the men and women and those that could understand the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. That means the end time church that's going to grow up is going to have a strong desire to hear the word and they're going to hear it, and they're going to hear it a lot. These guys were hearing it six hours a day, continually, getting the word in them. Come down to verse 7. It speaks of all these ones that caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they gained the understanding, as then, of course, we know that comes because of doing the word consistently. So they read in the book of the law distinctly, gave the sense, caused them to understand the reading. This is all speaking of the fact that we're going to hear the Word of God, we're going to grow up, we're going to get the understanding. And how do you get the understanding? Because you have been doing it. This is what the church should have been experiencing all along. But we've had a problem in the ministry. The ministry has not done the Word of God. They've been taught in Bible schools, take a text, take your few points, throw in a couple jokes here and there, or whatever, tell a few th stories and things like that, and uh, don't make the services too long. <laughs> six hours? <laughs> How many people will last for six hours and t the way they have the mentality today? <laughs> Not a lot of them. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9 this is what was all preachers were supposed to have been doing all along in the church age. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, not all this other stuff. He gave good heed and sought out and set in order the many proverbs. He has to go study and find all these truths out and set them all in order himself. 
the preacher sought to find acceptable words. What are the acceptable words to bring forth? Whatever he thinks, his opinions, his stories, his talking about himself or whatever? No. That which was written was upright, even words of truth. So what should he bring bringing forth? The Word of God, Scripture after Scripture, point after point, in order to teach the people the truth. As they do it, they will gain the spiritual understanding. They will be building the spiritual house of God in their life. Now, we come to Nehemiah 8.14. They found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses, the children of Israel shall dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. This is the time of tabernacles. And they would dwell in these booths, and they got what they would do. They should publish, proclaim in their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth in the mount, fetch the olive branches, the pine branches, the myrtle branches, the palm branches, branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. A booth was a temporary dwelling place, and they were to come and dwell in it. It is showing them in this end time church that we're going to hear the word, and we must realize you are in a temporary dwelling place, and you're not going to be in it for long. What temporary dwelling place is that? That's in your body, because what's coming? What's coming is that you're going to get a brand new body at the rapture where you're going to be changed and you're going to get a brand new body. The glorified body is going to come. And of course, as these guys making the booze, that meant that they were going to be there certainly filled up with the things of God. And every one of them, they began to hear the word as we see. We already saw it before. And here it says day by day from the first day to the last day in tabernacles. He read in the book of the law of God. People were hearing the word. That's how you're going to grow up. They kept the feast seven days. And the eighth day was the solemn assembly according to the manner. Which is seeing the fulfillment of all of this which you'll see in a moment. Another thing that we see. So this speaks of the fact the end time church is going to hear the word. They're going to do the Word. They're going to build their spiritual house. They're going to get so filled up with the Word, and they realize the fact that they're in a temporary dwelling place, but they're going to get the Word in them, and they're going to be carrying out the ministry of the Lord. At the same time, they must understand they cannot be around that which is evil. In Nehemiah chapter 9 here, we see in verse 2 that the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers, stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. That meant they dealt with everything that was not of God, and it had to be gotten out of their life. And in verse 3, they stood up their place, read in the book of the law of the Lord their God, one-fourth part of the day. One-fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. I mean, that's half the day they're doing the things of God. These people are confessing worshiping, hearing the Word of God continually. This is what is going to happen in the end time church for the people that are going to grow up. They're going to hear the Word. They're going to learn the Word. They're going to do the Word. They're going to be worshiping God as well, ministering unto Him to see Him accomplish His great end time work. At the same time, you must understand that, there, that we've seen before and we talked about it, end time uh, False prophets will come forth in the end time. These false prophets are going to be in trouble if they don't come to repentance. This is a guy in verse 1. Hananiah, he was the son of Azar the prophet. He was speaking to the house of the Lord, which would be a type of prophets speaking to the church. This is the time when they were going to go into Babylonian captivity. It was already set. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Meaning, you're not going to be going to Babylon. I'm going to break this bondage of Babylon off of you. Was that what was going to happen? No, they were going to be going to Babylon for 70 years captivity. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. He said, two years I'm going to deliver you out of all this that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. Otherwise, we're going to see a total restoration in two years. Was that the truth? Not whatsoever. We come down to verse 9. And 
Jeremiah saying, The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him, if he's the true one. Well, Ananiah took this yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it, saying that this is going to, all, referring to this bondage being broken in two years, as he said, within a space of two years. So he says he's going to, he reiterates what he said before. Well, this wasn't true whatsoever. And this is what Jeremiah comes and tells him. Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou hast made them for yokes of iron. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations. They may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They'll serve him, and I've given the, him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, and thou makest this people to trust in a lie. Anybody who speaks things that are contrary to the word is making people believe a lie. And because there will be false prophets and false teachers, and the false prophets will be such that it will deceive many, as it says, they're going to be speaking things that are contrary to the truth. What's going to happen to these guys? Oh, they're not going to get away with it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Anybody that teaches contrary to the word is going to die. And look when it says when they're going to die. It gives you the revelation of what this is talking about. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Why would it say that? Because it's given you a revelation that these false prophets... Oh, they might be deceiving people, but they're going to die. Woe unto these false prophets. They, they better not. We pray for them to come to repentance, but false prophets in the end times, which it says that will rise up, they will die. They are in trouble. They must walk in the ways of the Lord and do what is right and only speak what is from the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8. In fact, let's go back one verse here. Whoops. 1 Kings chapter uh, 8, and then we'll go back one verse. So was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. The temple of Solomon is a type of the end time church, the work being done in the end time church. Solomon brought in the things which David his father dedicated, even the silver gold vessels he put up among the treasures of the house of the Lord. He assembled them all, all the heads of them, says, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the city of David, which is Zion. And they brought this all up. It says, all the men of Israel assembled themselves into King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. Now, in the church, the t later on, after the exile, when they went into captivity after that, the seventh month was known as Tishri. But there was a time when this was known as, this Jewish month name was known as Ethanim, which means permanent streams flowing. Permanent streams flowing. And that is what it really is all about in the fulfillment of what the seventh month is about, which will happen at the end of tabern at uh, end of the church age, for the church will come to perfection. It will grow up in all things. We know this from John chapter seven, in verse thirty-seven, where it says, "The last day, the great day of the feast." This is the very end of tabernacles, indicating the fulfillment of the work of God. Jesus stood and cried, saying, "If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink." He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is the permanent stream's fulfillment of what the name really means, which is what God purposes for the end time church. And you will see that in a little bit when we get to this in some other scriptures. So, we go back over to 1 Kings talking about what's going to come into pass in the seventh month. We come to verse 4. 
They brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation, all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. Well, this is talking about the church with the holy vessels is what it's a type of, those who come to the place of holiness. And here, all the ones that were assembling them, they were sacrificing with sacrifices that could not be told for the number of multitude. Because what is the end time church going to be that is going to grow up to maturity? They're going to be those that have denied themselves. And they're going to be totally giving themselves unto all the things that God wants. They'll be continually offering up the sacrifice of praise. They'll be continually giving themselves and ministering to others. These are all the sacrifices. Sacrifices you giving out in some capacity in your life. There was tremendous number of sacrifices that were being sent forth. What else do we see at this time? They drew out the staves. Remember, the staves were the way they carried the presence of God around from place to place in the tabernacle. That the end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without, and they were unto this day. So they, they pulled them out of the ark, which is what they carried around where the presence of God was. No more was the ark going to be moved once they pulled the staves out. It was going to be stationary which is a revelation of what? The presence of God is going to be stationary in this end time church that's become the holy vessels that has seen the work of God accomplished in it. And notice what it says. There's nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone. What's going to be in those people who are in this end time church that come to this place of fulfillment? They have nothing in them but the word of God. That's all that was in them. That's what's all to be in you. You don't want anything evil. You don't want anything of the flesh. You don't want anything of the world. All you want is the things that are of the Word of God. All that was in them here in the ark is the two tables of stone, and that's all a type of the work being accomplished in us. And furthermore, the priests that come out of the holy place, they come to the place of holiness, notice that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Meaning, when the church comes to the place of being filled with the Word of God and come to the place of being holy vessels unto the Lord and the presence of God is manifested mightily in them, they're going to come to the place of seeing the glory of God poured out because this is the glory of God. The priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. We see this also brought forth over in 2 Chronicles, but a few other things in addition. 2 Chronicles 5, 1, when it speaks about the house of the Lord finished, that's talking about the completed work in the end time church and how it was dedicated. The dedicated, perfected church will come forth in these last days. They all assembled together, as we saw. It was all in the time of the seventh month, which is prophetic of the end time church. It was also, they had the holy vessels now, as we saw. They were offering up these multitude of sacrifices. This is the same thing. It also drew out the staves of the ark so that it wasn't going to be moving. The presence of God was going to be manifest now in the end time church with nothing in the ark except the two tables which would be the Word of God. And then it talks further. It says, the priests that came out of the holy place, and then it says more about them. Because what happened? The priests, and who are priests today? All of us. We are priests now under Jesus Christ, the high, the high priest of the New, top, New Testament. All the priests that were present were sanctified, become holy and consecrated, and did not wait then by course, it says the Levites, who were the priests, were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Hed, Heman, of, of Jeduthun, and their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen. What's white linen speak of? Righteousness. This is speaking of the end time church being arrayed in righteousness. Having cymbals, psalteries, and harps stood at the east end of the altar with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with trumpets. A hundred and twenty in scripture is the number of the change of an age. It is the number of of the change which was from the Old Testament age to the New Testament age. That's why there were 120 in the upper room when the time of Pentecost was poured out. This is talking about the end of the church age when the time for 
the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus, which starts with the judgments being poured out, this is talking about that church which has come to fruition, the end time church, they're, what's they going to be? They're the ones who are going to be holy, consecrated, dedicated, righteous, arrayed in fine linen. And what's going to happen with them? Here it says that as they came to pass, the trumpeter and singers were as one. They're going to become one. To make one sound and heard and praising and thanking the Lord. They lifted up their voice with the trumpets, cymbals, instruments of music and praised the Lord. They're going to be praising God. He's good, his mercy endures forever, that the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. This again is the glory of the Lord filling the end time house of the Lord, which is going to happen. You see, Jesus prayed a prayer. This prayer will be fulfilled in John 17. He prayed several things that are important. One of the things he prayed, he said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. We're not being taken out of the world. We're being kept from the evil as we are walking in the ways of the Lord. And he talks about sanctify them through the truth. This bringing the church to the place of sancti being fully sanctified and holy will be because of the truth, the word in each one that they're hearing and doing. Also, these end time church is going to preach the gospel. As thou hast sent me into the world, even have I sent them into the world. We are to bring forth the gospel, the truth, to the world. And he says, As for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth, that's through the word. And then verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That means there is going to come a group which will be a remnant, the end time glorious church that will be one, that will be powerful, that will be mighty. It will be, have a greater glory than the, end time, the early church, the end time church, the glory of God is greater than that. And we see that this is also declared of what's going to happen when the true ministry comes forth and quits preaching all the things that they should not be preaching, but starts bringing forth what they should be doing. Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for what? For the perfecting of the saints. They're going to bring us to the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, that we do the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, it's going to grow up and get strong till we all might come to the unity of the faith and the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God to what? The perfect man. The perfect man is coming forth. We're going on to perfection. Remember, when the foundation is laid, you go on to perfection, Hebrews 6.1. Unto the measure of the stature, the word stature is a metaphor for the attained state fit for a thing, meaning what is the state we're to come to? of the perfected man of the fullness of Christ. Otherwise, every single Christian who is walking in the ways of the Lord and is going to see this work be accomplished if they do what is necessary. And they are going to be raised up. The glory of God is going to come on this end time church. We see it in Isaiah chapter 60. And this is a picture of even what we begin, we're going to see, and you can see the beginning of it from today. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Who's that? The end time church. The glory of God is going to rise on it. Verse 2, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. It aren't the people that are rejecting the way of the Lord getting darker and darker and more evil and more sinful? Sure they are. But the Lord shall arise on thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. The glory of God is going to manifest mightily on the end time church, and we're going to see these things coming to pass. Now, remember in John chapter 10, verse 22. 
This literally says, because the word dedication, which is this word here in the Greek, is plural. And the word Jerusalem is not singular. It is plural. It's not talking about a place. It's talking about a people who have seen the work of God done. Because the Jerusalems is, refers to those who have come to the place of being holy through the teaching, and they've seen the complete work. Shalom refers to the complete work being accomplished. The dedications in the Jerusalems, literally is what it says, that came. When did it come to pass? This means it's come to become or come to pass. And it was winter. Well, what's winter? Winter is the time of stormy tempest. And this is what happens in the fulfillment of the dedications, which is the ninth month, 25th day. That is the time of the dedication of the cleansing of the church and coming to the place of being holy and fulfilling the work of God. It is going to happen. What was happening at this time? Verse 23, Jesus was walking. This is in the imperfect tense, which means was walking ongoingly in the temple in Solomon's porch. What's that? That's the end time church. So what's he doing? In the, he's walking in the end time church. And what was he doing? Remember, he was teaching. He's teaching the word of God, bringing the truth. Now, as he is doing this, the Jews, which are a type of those people who, of course, they were an unbelief. It'll be a type of those people who are an unbelief in the way of the world. The Jews came round about and said, how long do you make us to doubt? If you be the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, he told them many times before, and yet they didn't believe. This is going to be a type of the world that will not believe. He said, I told you, and you believe not. He even said, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me, but they still wouldn't believe. You believe not, because you're not of my sheep. Who's going to be the real believers? The sheep. Who will not be the real believers? The ones that aren't sheep. The ones that are follow, not following him as a sheep follows the shepherd will not be believing and holding fast to him and seeing this mighty work be accomplished in them. My sheep hear my voice. Why? Because they're so close to him and they're hearing his word. I know them and they follow me. Those that are hearing, those that are following him, those that are walking closely to him as a sheep follows the shepherd, that are knowing him, that are real disciples, that develop a personal intimate fellowship with him, they're going to be the ones that are going to be this mighty remnant in the last days that are going to come to the dedications of the completed one, the completed work accomplished. Now, another thing we need to look at because we saw that the outpouring of the rivers of living waters was poured out on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, that means this is going to happen in the end time church. We see in Psalm 65, verse 9, it says this, Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enriched it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly, thou settest the furrows, therefore thou makest it soft with showers, thou blessest the springing thereof. This is speaking of him visiting the earth and bringing the water which is going to bring forth this river of God, full of water, which is the word coming into the end time church that's going to bring forth all of this tremendous fruit and the harvest that is going to come forth. Also, we see in Psalms 46. This is an important psalm to understand because of its impact on the days we're in and what is going to happen. God is our refuge and our strength, our refuge, our place of shelter, and our place of our strength, a very present help in trouble. What's coming? The greatest trouble that's ever come to the earth, the greatest pressure, it's coming. Therefore, will we not fear? You cannot fear, you'll give place to the enemy. While what's happening with this trouble? 
though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof, volcanoes, earthquakes, earth, the seas roaring, everything being up, a tremendous upheaval in the earth which is going to happen. There is a river at the same time. The streams thereof will make the city, glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Who's that? The end time church that's come to the glorious state, the fulfilled attained state, the perfected church. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Remember he's coming to dwell in us. The, the staves are pulled out. It's not moving anymore. The presence of God is going to be manifested mightily in this end time church. And this is the group. And you can tell it's talking about the church because of the next verse says, God is in the midst of her. That's the church. This end time glorious church. She shall not be moved because they're not going to be afraid. They understand what's coming. See, that's why you got to understand what's coming. You cannot be moved because you're going to see unbelievable shaking on things that are going to happen in the coming days. God shall help her. And that right early, it's interesting, this means at the break of day, at the very beginning. God will be there to help those ones who are the remnant, who are where God's in the midst of them, the ones that have come to the place of the holy place of the tabernacles of God, that got the river in them, the streams flowing out of them, which is the word of God in them. At the same time, the heathen raged. Why? Because the judgments are coming and they're going to be going crazy. They're going to be, men are going to be upset. They're going to be raging. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. There's going to be tremendous things that are going to be happening. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. That's what's going to happen. Because judgments are coming as the judgments are being unfolded. And then verse 9, this is what happens when it's all over in the millennial reign. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cutteth the spear in asunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. That's going to be the end result. But you have to understand in this end time church that here's the word. The waters are the word of God that must come into you and fill you. Remember in John, we talked about how they took the water pots and they filled them up to the brim so it became fruitful. That's what's to happen in you because you got to be fruitful in order to be righteous and to be holy before the Lord. In Ezekiel chapter 47, he speaks about the waters that are coming now into the house of the Lord. And these waters are coming in. And we see, as he says, in coming down to verse 3, When the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. He brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Oh, they're coming, they're starting to fill up the house of the Lord, up to the ankles. He measured again, and now they're up to the knees. He measured again. And now, what if they brought me through and the waters were up to the loins? And then, as he continued, he measured a thousand. There was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen to swim in a river that could not be passed over. This is the river of God that's going to come into the end time church that is going to be filled with the word of God. And he's brought them to this, this river. And at the bank of the river, there are many trees on one side on the other. And the waters issue toward the east country, go down the desert, out in the sea, brought forth in the sea, the waters will be healed. And he says, It come to pass everything that liveth which moveth whithersoever the rivers shall come. And where are the rivers coming out of? The end time church. The rivers of living water are going to flow forth. Shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish. That's people being born again, being caught coming to the receive Jesus, because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything that liveth, whether the river cometh. It's going to, otherwise, life is going to come from this mighty anointing that's going to come forth from the church that is full of the Word of God, has become fruitful. 
the glorious end time church. Now, we talked about Hagehi, and we're going to cover this a little bit again, not as in depth as we did because we've already covered it. But we will in point, point out a few of the important things. This Hagehi is talking about this mighty end time work. Now, anybody that thinks that they aren't to be on board on doing this work or the building the house of God is not hearing the Lord whatsoever. Oh, the people are saying the time's not to come, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. Oh, no, they're wrong. He comes and he says, this house is lying in waste. Consider your ways. You're going nowhere. And he talks about how whatever they were doing was not producing any fruit. You sow much, you bring in little. You have not enough, you drink, you're not filled with drink. Clothe you, none warm. Otherwise, no prosperity or blessing in their life. He talks about going and start building the house, and I'll take pleasure in it. What house are we to be building? The spiritual house of God. And then he can, brings and says why he blew on everything that they were doing. It was just falling and coming to, coming to naught. Because my house that's waste, and you run every man into your own house. Anybody who's living a selfish life will be going nowhere and will be not approved of God if they're not building the spiritual house in their own life. And so what happened to all these ones? They have all judgments, drought, things, you know, th no blessing on the labor of their hands, all kinds of problems. Now, in verse 12, he speaks of those ones as the remnant. These are the ones that are going to be the few that are going to listen. The people are going to obey the voice of the Lord. They're going to have the fear before God. These are the ones that are going to be, God is going to be with them, not with everybody, only the ones that are walking in the way of the Lord. This is the remnant, and they're going to come and do work in the house of the Lord. They're going to build the spiritual house in their life and see it be accomplished. We come to the seventh month now. In the one and twentieth day of the month, that would be at the end of tabernacles, prophetic of the end of the work being accomplished in the church. And what's going to happen to these guys? These are the ones who are going to see the glory of God poured out because they've seen the work done. Verse 3, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes? Comparison is nothing. It's right. It's like nothing. He says, be strong. Everybody's going to have to get strong. And you're going to be a doer, not work, but it's the word of saw, meaning you're going to be doing, for I am with thee. Those who get strong through the word in you and are doers of the word, God's going to be with them. These are the ones, according to the word that I covenanted with you, of what he's going to bring forth, this glorious, perfected church. The spirit remains among you, fear not. We cannot be afraid of all the things that are going to be happening because of the great shaking. And here he speaks of it. He says, for... Thus saith the Lord, it's once, yet once a little while I'll shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. He is going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'll shake all nations. The desire of all nations will come. And I'll fill this house with glory. The end time perfected church will be filled with a glory. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. And in this place will I give peace, meaning completeness has been accomplished of the work of God in their life. That is what he's bringing forth. And we also saw the 24th day of the ninth month where they saw the fact that there was uncleanness. And then he makes the statement to him. He says, so is this people in this nation. They're all unclean. All the uncleanness has to be gotten out of your life or you will not be a part of the glorious church. He said how they were laying stone upon stone. Well, that's the building. It's little by little. Here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. There's no shortcuts. You're going to have to, through the word of God in your life. And here it came to the fact that they weren't being blessed because they had 20 measures, but there were but 10. Drew out, tried to draw out 50 vessels, but there were only 20. That means there's, there's a curse upon them. They were cursed. He said, I smote you with a blasting, all these different curses because they weren't doing right, and yet they still wouldn't repent or turn to Him. We see a lot of people that continue to walk in their own ways. They continue to walk in sin. 
They won't do what God wants them to do. But now he says, from this day, from the foundation of the Lord's temple, when it gets laid, now, this is speaking again of the hearers and doers of the word, he said, from this day, I'm going to bless you. And what's going to happen? This is the same time when he's shaking the heavens and the earth. And what's going to be the result? During that time, he's going to bring the judgments upon the nations, overthrow the throne of kingdoms, destroy the strength of the kingdoms of all the heathen, overthrow all of their works totally. They're going to be all be brought down with all the judgments that are going to happen. And then he says, I'm going to take you, speaking of the ones who have got the foundation and seen the completed work be done, and this is on the ninth month, 25th day, which is the time of the dedications of the holy ones, the church. He says, for I've chosen you. Why are we chosen? Because we obeyed the call of God. Many are called, few are chosen. The only ones that are chosen are the ones that have obeyed the call of God and worked out their own salvation and done what was necessary to see the work accomplished. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be made as a signet, which is the signet ring. They're going to be set, this means as a signet, which means what? They're going to give authority. They're going to be given authority to rule and to reign. And that will be in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This is all the end time work that is going to be accomplished. And one last thing that we want to bring to you. When Jesus accomplishes this tremendous work, he will catch the church up to meet the Lord in the air to fulfill trumpets, which is the rapture. The marriage will occur in heaven for 10 days. Then on the 10th day of the seventh month, the day of atonement, the church will come back with Jesus and bring the judgment upon the nations, which will occur. And then five days later, later will be the time of tabernacles. He will set up his millennial reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Those who have passed the test, those who have been given the signet, the authority, they are going to be in the position to rule and reign. And Jesus is going to rule and reign. Zechariah 14, 16 tells us, not everybody's going to die in the judgment that comes at the time of the Day of Atonement. It shall come to pass that everyone that's left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, there'll be some that'll be left, and they're going to be the ones that will start to repopulate the earth over that thousand years shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Otherwise, Jesus is going to be the king on earth, and they have to come and worship him. And to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the memorial for him, having accomplished the total work, not only in the body of Christ, but also to bring forth the recovery of the earth and bring forth the rule of God on the earth, which he does for a thousand years years. It shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. He's going to rule with a rod of iron, according to the word. And there isn't going to be any way other than that. Those who do not obey him, they're going to see curses come upon them. The rain will be withheld from them. If the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there'll be a plague plagues or judgments will still be poured out during the millennial reign on those who are disobedient. No one will get away with anything. For the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus is going to rule and reign according to righteousness and holiness and what is right. And there will be judgments for those who are rebellious. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that come up not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Everyone must do it. And that day there'll be the bells on the bells of the horses, holiness unto the Lord. Everybody walks in holiness. Jesus is going to rule and reign. And you aren't going to walk in any other way because he is going to bring forth his rule on the earth. God is going to raise up a tremendous time. It'll be a time. And who's going to rule and reign with him? Only those ones who have come to the place of seeing the fulfillment of the work of God 
in their life. Not everybody. Blessed is he and holy as has part in his first resurrection of such that second death has no authority. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Who's going to be reigning? The ones who get the signet. The ones who have been given authority. And they're the ones that have been chosen. And remember, who is coming back with Jesus? Here are the qualities established in them that causes them to be with him. When they make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. They that are with him are the called. We've all been called. The chosen, only a few are chosen because unfortunately only a few, the remnant, are responding to it. And the faithful. Remember, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the, you know, the, the blessings of God, the, the joy of the Lord, have authority over five cities or ten cities or over the nations or whatever it might be. The called, the chosen, and the faithful are the ones who are going to be with him. So that means the work of God's got to be done. The rest of the group, unfortunately, will probably be the ones that are the fallaway group that have turned away, that are going to be in the apostasy. There will be an apostasy, remember. Remember that the deception that's coming will be so great that even the very elect, the very chosen, I mean, it's the same word for elect, could be deceived. Who will not be deceived? The ones that are, have the word in them, are walking in the word, established in it, and will not turn away from it under any circumstance. And that's what has to happen for you and for me. And that's what's going to happen because we're going to be doers of the word of God. This is the revelation of the seventh month, which is the fulfillment of the work of God in the end time church, and then the performance of the, what the feasts are about by Jesus Christ as he brings forth the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air of the rapture, the judgment coming upon the nations, and then the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It will be a time of rule according to the word of God on earth for a thousand years. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the seventh month and the work of God that is being done and will be accomplished in the body of Christ who will obey the few, the remnant, the ones that will do what he says and meet the conditions. I thank you. I am building the spiritual house of God in my life. I am working out my own salvation. I am getting rid of all uncleanness out of my life. I am putting on the garments of God. I will be sanctified, holy, righteous before the Lord. I will be without spot and without wrinkle. And I will see the glory of God poured out mightily. The waters are coming into me to fill me up. And the river in me will be flowing out to others to bring forth the mighty work of the Lord to see people saved and come out of the ways of darkness. I thank you. I will be a part of that river that's going to be coming into the earth because of the word in me, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High, the presence of God manifest in the glorious end time church. I thank you that I am making myself one who can receive the glory of God. I thank you that God will be with us and he'll be manifesting through us and we will not be moved in the face of all that's coming. I thank you for this mighty work you're accomplishing to bring me to the place of being a part of the glorious, perfected, end-time church. Thank you for accomplishing this work as I am a hearer and a doer of your word. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for every, everyone understanding the seventh month is not just talking about a time when things happen, but it's a revelation of the work being accomplished in the end time church to see them be ready for the outpouring of the glory of God on this end time church. Thank you, Father, for the mighty work that you're accomplishing. Thank you that we'll hearken diligently unto all that we have heard, being hearers and doers of the word, and see your work accomplished in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.